Church, today we're going to continue in our sermon series uh, that we've been working through this whole month, and it's entitled Baggage, but today we're going to be talking about our emotional baggage. You know, the goal for all of us here today, and, and I hope you're paying attention in, in getting this, but the goal for all of us will be let to, the power of God, the silence, you know, the lies that we often believe in our own heads. How many of you have heard something over and over again, and you know it's a lie, but yet you still struggle with it floating in your mind? Isaiah 41 verse 10 tells us this. It says, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Church, I just want to be honest with you. This, uh, this past week's been really, really hard for me. You know, it, it's been really rough. And it, at the beginning of the week, last Sunday after, after church and just some really great things that happened at home and, and with my family, you know, it started out the week to be really good for me. And I don't know how you are. If my Sunday starts out good, it's typically a sign the rest of the week's going to be amazing. So it had all the makings to be a, a really great week. And, 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 you know, in one day I had a ton of really good things happen to me in my life. I was feeling good and, and I was, you know, gathering steam to move forward into the week, thinking things were going to be great. And then the very next morning I ended up having one very negative encounter with someone. And this person said some things to me um, that were not very nice. We'll just say, it. we'll leave it like that. Uh, accused me of saying some things, of, of doing some things that I never said or did. And, and then here's what happened. This person was very angry and upset with me. And, and so the week started out that on Sunday evening, man, I had so many reasons to have a wonderful week filled with joy. And then one negative encounter, church, it caused me to spiral into this deep, emotional struggle one negative encounter for whatever reason I'm not sure why but why is it that all of us and I'm sure you're on the same page as I am how come that when we 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 find it easier to believe the bad things you know what I'm talking about I'm talking about we, we internalize way more bad stuff than we do good stuff. Someone can say wonderful things to you all the time and just build you up and, and praise you, and, and, and we maybe just hold on to a little bit of that, but one person says something nasty, man, you grab onto it with both fists and you hug it, and we hold on to it. That's what emotional baggage is, church, the things that we hold on to. We find it easier to believe the negative then we do the positive in our lives. And so no matter how many times, church, no matter how many times you hear some really good stuff, what we end up doing is we take one negative thing and we begin to own it. So today what I want to do to kick off this sermon, I want to ask you one question. One question I want to ask you, what negative emotional door have you left open? I'm talking about you're leaving it wide open, this negative emotional door for things to come in. So today, by the power of God, we're going to learn to close those doors and to get rid of the negative words that are spoken to us. That's what we want to learn today. It would be like, I want us to start identifying the negativity in our lives so that we can have the battle against it. So I want to share with you first three negative statements that a lot of us we hold on to, that we, we struggle with and we battle with. And the very first one is this, you don't fit in. Some of you have heard that. Maybe they've demonstrated that, you know, you don't fit in. You don't belong here. You're, you're, you're not one of us. Maybe someone has said that to you straight up, right out. Or maybe they've said some, or done some things that conveys that response to you. See, when we hear this or experience those actions that towards us, it leads us to those negative thoughts, church. So we tend to slip in. When you hear those things, when you start to feel like you don't fit in, we tend to slip in a mode that's called being a conformer. Being a conformer. If you're writing things down today, I want you to write something down for me. When you feel that you don't fit in, it's easy to become a conformer. So it's where you try to make your actions live up to the expectations that you perceive that somebody else has put on you. 
The, 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 you know, you just feel that these people are expecting this from you, so you conform and you try to live up to those things. In the Old Testament, there was one of the greatest conformers ever. See, this guy, he felt like that he, he wasn't loved, right? He felt like he wasn't living up to the great expectations the people had for him, and his name was King Saul. So if you turn with me to 1 Samuel, this, this dude wrote a confession about this. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24, here's what he said. It says this, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. He conformed. He felt like their expectations was so high that he had to fulfill what they thought of him. He felt like he wasn't living up to the expectations of the people that he was ruling over, so he conformed his actions towards what he thought that they wanted from him. A lot of us do that, don't we? Think about, right? Maybe, maybe in your childhood or, or high school years, maybe it was similar to mine. I'm sure we all go through these things. It's generational. When I was in high school, Back in 1987, I remember going to my junior prom. Yeah, I'm dating myself now, right? Do the math. I'm 38. Do the math. <laughs> That's new math. They're teaching that new math to the kids. No, it's serious. 1987, I remember going to the prom at Beaver Local, and at the after prom, you had to have like three outfits for the prom at Beaver Local. And I remember at the after prom, we were going to some YMCA. We were going to stay up all night, play games. And there was these shorts that came out at the time. Some of you might be able to relate to this. They were called jams. They were really colorful, very Hawaiian looking, right? They had a big label on the back pocket about that big, and it said jams on them, okay? And I wanted a pair of jams because I wanted to be cool with the after prom, okay? And so here's what happened. I talked to my parents about it, but jams back then, I just did a little research this week, they were $30 a pair. And if you make it, you know, the inflation calculator, that would have made them $80 today. So I went to my parents, and, and my dad had a decent job. He just had too many kids. That's to be honest about it. <laughs> the pie only slices. it. You got one pie, you can slice it however you want to, right? It's still the same pie. And I went to my parents and said, hey, can I have a pair of jams? They're like, no. We don't have that kind of money. So my mom really felt bad. This is wild. My mom really felt bad. And by the way, my mom was not a seamstress, but she went out and bought this very colorful looking print fabric. My mom made me a pair of jams, okay? Yeah. But it gets better. I decided, okay, I think I can pull this off. I got a t-shirt that Hung down over the pocket so no one could see they weren't real jams. And I bent over playing volleyball, pick up the ball, and my buddy goes, hey, your jams tag ripped off your pocket. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it did, didn't it? <laughs> but you know what, church? I was so worried about conforming to what everybody else was doing. I wanted to fit in. And I would go at any lengths to do that, maybe for some of you. You do the same thing, but you morally try to conform. You're, you're, you're morally trying to conform. You know, I can't tell you how many people, man, in this job that I'm doing now, I can't tell you how many people, right, have compromised God's sexual standards for his people. And I see it all the time with our young people. They give away their virginity just in the hopes of being accepted, right? Or, or they go into drugs or, or alcohol, just craving, you know, please accept me. Please let me be part of what you're doing. And so what do we as adults do though? All right, we already picked on the young people. Let's talk about us as adults. One common thing that we do is we go into incredible debt, hoping that we can be liked by having material possessions. So we buy things that we can't afford, right? With money we don't have to impress people we really don't like at all just to fit in, just to fit in. How many of you can say that you've battled with that statement, I really don't fit in? That's one of the negative things right there. The second thing is this, the negative voice. If you're writing things down, write that down. The negative voice, the voice that plays over and over in your head. It's on a loop, right, church? I believe that all of you can say that you experienced that as well. That voice plays over and over in your head, you know, telling you these lies, telling you things like, you know what, no matter what, you aren't good enough, telling you that you don't measure up, that you don't have what it takes, right? And if you're like me, if you're like me, you battle with the thought of maybe not being good enough. 
not being good enough. So you slip into that mode, church, and what this mode is called being a performer, that you try to perform to please other people. You know what? If you don't think I'm good enough, let me prove to you I'm good enough. Let me show you. I'll prove this to you. Watch me perform to win your love. Watch me perform to win your approval. And we see a very powerful example of this in the New Testament, right? In Luke chapter 10. So if you're looking in your Bible with me, turn to Luke chapter 10. And I want you to look at verses 38 through 40. And so let me give you a little bit of background. So there's this woman named Martha. She's inviting Jesus over to her house. So Jesus is coming over the house, and if you read into this as I get ready to read these verses, I want you to gather maybe some of uh, her logic. Verse 38 says this, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord Don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Listen, think about this. This woman's thought process, if you read into this, maybe you can gather Martha's logic, right? Man, I've got Jesus in my house. Jesus is in my house. Jesus is here, right? I got to make sure that everything's perfect. I got to make sure all the kids' toys are picked up, right? I got to make sure the appetizers are just right. I got to do everything just so Jesus, if I perform well enough, he'll love me. See, for a lot of us, we felt not good enough, so we work our rear ends off just to prove somebody something. Like, you know what? I, I, I want to even prove it to myself that I'm worth something. So when you were a child, maybe it was making good grades. For those of you that were that smart, you know, you felt accepted. You felt loved by your parents because they were praising you. And then the very first time you ever get a B on your report card, might as well have been an F, right? Or maybe in sports, you always had to be the best. Maybe if you're in the band, you always had to be the first chair, right? Whatever it was, you were performing. And then one day you become an adult and then you begin to perform even more trying to please your boss in certain ways, right? Or or trying hard to please your husband, trying hard to please your wife. And then if everything is not perfect, you feel like you're a failure. You feel like you're a failure in life. And I know a lot of men, man, I know a lot of men who want to be perfect providers for their family. I mean, they want to be a perfect provider, so they spend their lives trying to make more money and more money and working harder and longer to make that money for their families, and all the families really and truly want is just more of them, not the money. Maybe it's being the perfect parent. Newsflash, you're never going to be a perfect parent. (laughs) You're not. But you feel like you want to, so you create these standards as a perfect parent, right? And you set these standards for yourself, and then you beat yourself up because you're not making those standards, and so you feel you're not good enough. And so no matter what you do, church, you hear that voice floating in your head that you're a failure. How many of you battle in this way? How many of you battle this way? Feeling that. The third negative point I want to give to you this morning is this. You feel that you're not worthy. The enemy loves to whisper in your ear, you are not worthy. You're not worthy of love. You're not worthy of acceptance. You're not worthy of God's forgiveness because of what you've done, right? See, those of you have been uh, going through life and you feel rejected, right? You've been rejected because you've heard that voice too much. Those who have been abandoned in life by someone, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a parent, Maybe it's a friend, you've been abandoned, and so you hear that voice. Those who's had a dad in their life that left for another woman, they hear that voice. Those whose parents were divorced, maybe you hear that voice, right? And you hear that voice, and then you wonder, right, what did I do wrong? What could I have done better for this not to have happened? If only I've done better things would be different. And then you hear that voice, church, you hear that voice of not being worthy. It's easy for us to become what I like to call a clinger from this. John chapter 4, if you'll look at this with me. In John chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus is talking to this woman, 
and, and, and she says this. She says, I have no husband. She replied, Jesus says to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. And then Jesus said, you don't have a husband for you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man that you're living with now. This woman right here that Jesus was having dialogue with, it, she maybe struggled in this way. It's very obvious that maybe this woman was trying to find meaning in men. And there's a lot of girls that struggle with that. They only feel special if they're getting attention from someone, even the negative attention. But the truth of the matter is, she needed to find meaning in her life, but it would only come from the Son of God. Yeah. Yeah. So she was a clinger looking for validation from people. And we see that a lot today in the world. We do. Some of the most wonderful women I've known, they'll cling to some of the most awful men that I've ever seen, just wanting validation. Or maybe they're hoping that they can make that person better. And when the truth of the matter is, you end up sinking in a codependent lifestyle. But you know what? That lifestyle will cost you way more than you can even imagine. Way more than you can imagine. So unless you get rid of that baggage, unless you discover who you are in Christ Jesus, then you're going to struggle. How many of you have battled with feelings of feeling unworthy, maybe unlovable? Today what we want to do is we want to close the doors on those negative things and open the door, and that's the door of truth. It's the door of truth. Remember, you are not who others say you are. One of the most profound things I ever heard in my life is a guy that told me that. He said, you're not who someone else says you are. You are who Christ says that you are. So there's three truths I want to give. Yeah, that's right. There are three truths that I want to give you today about who you are in Christ. And I want you to think about that phrase, in Christ. Christ and what that means. Too many times we skip over that piece where it says in Christ, right? If you are in Christ, it means that you are part of, he is in you, right? You are in him. That's what it means. So the first truth I want to give you is this. In Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ, you are forgiven. In 2 Corinthians, if you look at this with me, chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. So if you're in Christ, you're forgiven. Right? If you're in Christ, you're forgiven. You know, we, we do a thing at our house. Luckily, we've only done it like three or four times at our house when uh, one of our boys graduate high school. And um, sometimes it's Mary, sometimes it's me. We kind of have this thought process, like you got to remodel the whole house to have a party, right? I mean, you're painting the bedroom, even though no one's going to be in your bedroom. But, and, and so, you know, Jacob just graduated from high school, and so we're, we're getting ready for a party. And I remember going in the garage one day when I finally had to face it. You know what I'm talking about? you got to face it. And you go in there, and there's just junk everywhere. I'm thinking all this stuff has to go somewhere. And so you start going through things, and you're picking up things like, yeah, this don't even work. Why am I saving this, right? And you pick up that bolt that your great-grandfather gave you, and you put it in a baby food jar, and you got to keep it, right? you got to keep it because he put it in the baby food jar for you, and you might need it someday, even though he didn't use it, and your grandfather didn't use it, and your dad didn't use it, but you might. And so you save all this junk, and you accumulate, and then suddenly you got to get to this point where you're like, we got to get rid of this stuff. And you just clean it out. All the garbage, the junk, the baggage that you've accumulated in that garage because you got to do something. you got to make some room, church. Do you realize this? If you are in Christ, it means you are forgiven. That means all your old junk, all your old filth, all your sin, all your shame, it goes. It gets swept away. It gets taken away, right? It's as though it's never happened before. And in God's eyes, I love how God looks at things and how God works. In God's eyes, it's cast into that sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought up again. Never to be brought up again. And so you are a brand new creation. A brand new creation. The problem is, even though Christ has forgiven you, and some of us struggle with this, even though Christ has forgiven you, you know what happens, church? You have not forgiven yourself. 
The enemy knows it and he holds on to that. And he reminds you, remember what you've done? Remember what you said? Remember how you acted, right? See, you can get forgiveness from man. You can get forgiveness from God. But a lot of you guys, you struggle with forgiveness from yourself about what it is that you've had in your life. And so you're still carrying this shame. You're still carrying this baggage. And and listen, many of you, you are in Christ. Remember, in Christ. That means you've been forgiven by God. So you have to forgive yourself. And when you can't forgive yourself, then those voices come back and tells you this, right? You are unworthy. Tells you that you are not good enough, that you don't deserve anything. You don't deserve God's forgiveness. You don't deserve God's grace. And it's time, church, for you to forgive yourself and move on. You don't have to stay there. You no longer have to stay there. Because in Christ, it's not because you've earned it. You sure don't deserve it. Be thankful you don't get what you deserve, by the way. And when you accept Christ, you've been forgiven because Jesus is ultimately good, right? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, I love what it says here. It says, in him, there we go again, right? In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So in Christ, we have redemption, through the blood that he shed on the cross. We have forgiveness of sins in accordance with God's riches, great riches of grace that he has for you. In Christ, you are forgiven. The second truth I want to give you today is this. In Christ, you are secure. In Christ, you are secure. Second Corinthians, chapter, or Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, 22, it says this. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set a seal of ownership on us. And he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Security. This is the security in that verse. So when, whenever, church, you feel insecure... Whenever you feel those negative voices that keeps coming over you, right? Remember, you are secure. Not because of who you are, but because of whose you are. And that's in Christ Jesus. You're secure because you are in Christ. Because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is living in you. Right? And and you are secure because you've been sealed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. At my previous job I had, I remember, it, there was a really large office area at my previous p- uh, place I worked, and, and then there was a, a whole plant behind it, like a warehouse and everything, and I remember when I got into management, my boss gave me a key, and, and I'm looking at this big, it's a great big key, and he goes, that key will open up everything here in the building, and I, I was like a little kid, I was so excited, I had the key, okay, and I'm like, does this key open this room? He's like, yeah, it opens that room. I'm like, what, what about the goodie room? The goodie room was where they stored all the cool Coca-Cola jackets and everything. I said, well, yeah, it'll open that. And I kept going on and on. Will it open this? Will it open this? Finally, he goes, this key will open up everything in the complex. It will open all of it up. It will open every single door. And so listen, church. As my boss told me, that key gave me full access full access to everything that was needed in order to do the job that I was called to. Church, do you realize that you have full access? When you are in Christ Jesus, you have full access to your heavenly father. Nobody has to go there on your behalf. That's over with. Nobody has to go there and plead the case for you. No, listen, you have full access to the throne room of God. You do. And it says who you are. You have full access to God's grace because you are secure in Christ. You are not, church, you are not secure because of who you are. You are not secure because of what you know. You are secure because of who you know, and that's Christ Jesus. That's why you're secure. You're not secure because of what other people think about you, because it's all about what God thinks about you. You have full access to every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, and you must believe who you are because of who God says you are. 
The third truth I want to give you this morning is this. In Christ, I'm free. In Christ Jesus, I am free free. In Christ, you are absolutely and completely free. Man, in John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 36, it says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed, right? You'll be free indeed. That's who you are. And so when Christ sets you free, that means you are free from your past. When Christ sets you free, that means you are free from those hurts. When Christ sets you free, you can be free from those negative words. You are free from the voices, church, that continue to haunt you. And you are free from the addictions that have a hold on you. You're free from the baggage that has slowed you down. So in Christ Jesus, you are free. Church, you are free to be everything that your heavenly Father created you to be. You're free to do that. You are free from the negative words that people spoke about you. You are free to be all that God created you to be. Like I told you in the beginning of the sermon, last week on Sunday evening, I had a hundred reasons to be overjoyed about my life. I really did. I'm not kidding you. I had a hundred reasons to be overjoyed about my life. Then one negative person sent me in this spiral. I'm talking about a spiral that was leading towards just a depression. You know what I'm talking about? That heaviness, that, that, that pain and that hurt. And it was only when I stopped, listen, and this is key. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. It was only when I stopped and I grabbed the thought and did exactly what the Bible tells us to do. You take that thought captive. You take that thought captive. And I said, that's not who I am. That's not what I spoke. I am who Christ says I am. And listen, church, my reputation and my name, it's not something that I have to guard. My reputation, my name is not something that I have to guard. I I lay that down. God's reputation is the only name that is at stake, and he is big enough, and he is good enough to guard it all day long. That's who he is. So no longer do I have to carry the burden of what people think about me. As long as Christ says to me, church, well done, my good and faithful servant, and I'm free. I am completely free. And sometimes I'm tempted, church. I'm being honest with you. Sometimes I'm tempted to slip back and believe those negative things to believe the things that have been said. But then again, remember, you grab those things and you take those thoughts captive and you make them obedient to Christ because in him you are free. You're free. So in the times that those negative words haunt you, tells you that you're a failure, that you're no good, maybe you've heard the words, I wish I never had you. It tells you you aren't good enough that you don't measure up, that you don't belong, that you aren't worthy. I want to tell you this morning, church, you close the door on those painful words. Not only do you close, you slam that door shut. You take captive those thoughts. And remember, remember, church, you are not who other people say you are. You truly are who God says that you are. And that's why you leave one door open, and that's the door of truth. You leave that door open. That's that door of truth. That's that door of life. In church, we have to leave that baggage behind. You got to leave it behind. Because in Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ, you are secure. And in Christ Jesus, you have been set free. So as I ask the praise team to come up here this morning, some of you came to church this morning, and you're carrying some severe emotional baggage. Seriously, I I want you to know this was for you. This sermon was from you. There's no accident that you're here this morning. God ordained this day for all of us to be here. There's no surprises to him. When this message was formed three weeks ago, he had you in mind for this message. So that emotional baggage that you're carrying today, I'm telling you, it's time to release it. Do you realize that you can never, listen to me, church, you can never 
have the relational richness. You can never have the intimacy with God or even his people until you get rid of your baggage, until you set it free. Some of you this morning, you're believing these lies that the enemy's telling you, that you, you hear those voices, that you're not good enough, that you're dirty, that you're shameful, right? Listen, you replace those lies with truth. You get into his word and into his truth. So this morning as you're sitting here, and I wanna tell you something. If you've been forgiven, if you're already in Christ Jesus, if you've been forgiven, forgive yourself. Seriously, forgive yourself. You're no longer held accountable to that. It's over. It's been taken care of, it's been handled. I wanna encourage you, you relax in the security of Christ Jesus. In Christ, you're free. So act like it, act like it. Enjoy that freedom. Some of you here today, you don't have that security. You're here at church today and, and I believe that maybe the Lord's speaking to you. He's telling you, you know what, you wanna be free? It takes a right relationship with Christ personally, a personal relationship. And if you haven't given your life to him yet, this is for you. It's time. It's time for you to get rid of the baggage because the only way that you're gonna have freedom, the only way that you're gonna have security is through a right relationship with Jesus. So if that's for you, I wanna encourage you, you come forward. It's time for you to surrender to him. It's time for you to give him the things that you've been holding on to so tight in your life, it's making you sick, but yet you still hold on to it. He's saying, I wanna give you freedom. I wanna give you peace of mind. I wanna give you security. I wanna make you brand new. And he wants to take that sin and cast as far as the east is from the west, never to be brought up again, church. So if that's for you, I wanna encourage you, come forward today. We'll have people up here to pray for you. They can walk you through. Maybe you don't fully understand, but you feel God's calling you out. Still come forward. Let today be the day that you said, I want the freedom that God promises me in my life. So how about it, church? Let's stand here and let's sing. I wanna encourage you to respond this morning.